the last three and a half weeks, I've lived in Afghanistan on the front line with the Royal Anglian Regiment. We've just been hit. We're in the open. Uh... They have faced some of the most ferocious fighting the British soldiers have been involved in for over 40 years. In the six weeks since they arrived, they have suffered 16 wounded and three killed in action. The RPG guy that just tried to launch one in here, sniper, just next to me, has just killed him. Three weeks ago, I joined them on Operation Last Day Kulang to clear the Taliban from around Sangin in Helmand province. After a week of exhausting and intense enemy contact, B Company are resupplied and continue to patrol the green zone. But our technical equipment is suffering, and so are myself and the crew. We return to Bastion and wait to rejoin them on their next deployment. After weeks in the field, B Company returned to Camp Bastion exhausted. You can feel the sense of relief that the convoy has safely returned with no further casualties. Operation Last Day Kulang was expected to last only four days. Good seeing you back in one piece. Yes, fuck, it's good to be back in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> I, was surprised, mate. I was shitting myself at those mine strikes. Well, okay. I think everybody was. We had two mine strikes on the convoy as soon as we left Fob Robinson, which was a, a bit of a shock for everyone. Fortunately, um, there was no casualties, and uh, I'm just, I'm just really, really happy that we got everybody back. With it, with two incidents like that that happened within 30, 30 minutes and about 200 metres of each other, we we're lucky not to have casualties. It's just good to get all the boys back here in one piece. I've seen for myself the damage a mine strike can do when one of our vehicles hits a mine. So the next morning, it's a relief to see the full convoy back in base safely. It would have been nicer if we'd had pre-warning that we were going to be out for so long, so then obviously we could have done more packing for it. Tell me about the kind of things that do get you after a while. Is it just not having somewhere to wash, or what is it? It's the rations that got to me. Is in the first week was all right, then I the second week started getting a bit fucking boring, and the third week I had to physically force myself to eat the food because I just couldn't stand it anymore. It was just the same shit every day, having to wear the same dirty socks, the same dirty clothes. It just it fucking gets to you, and the bloke's just fucking exhausted, especially having to carry all the fucking extra ammo, the food. My morale was lifted as soon as I got in the helicopter, as, as probably Teddy's was as well, because we know that when we come back, showers, hot water, relatively hot water, fresh food. Cambastian may not be the Ritz, but the basic luxuries of freshly cooked food, a bed, and most importantly, lots of water, put smiles on most faces. After being away for the best part of a month, it takes several showers to scrape away the grime. Most of the guys from B Company are now back in Camp Bastion, as you can see. They're taking well-deserved showers, are getting some food inside them, and most importantly of all, they've got three weeks of mail to catch up on. Your parcels reached you okay. We just thought we would uh, drop you a line to let you know we are thinking of you all. We're so proud of you. Till next time, Julie, Neil, Josh, Ben, Erin, and Nan. That's the ones who sent us their parcel with all the food in it. Yeah. 
you want? What's, what do you want? Head can. Head can. That's what you wanted, yeah? Yeah. How important is it getting like like that? You've you've come a godfather, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, so look, that's. It's my mate, uh, Sergeant Stu Hicks. He's a recruiting guy. Yeah, he's, he's in Cambridge recruiting at the moment. And um, BB. <laughs> and it's, it's, it is really high for morale, and I'm, I'm chuffed to bits to, to be seeing this. So it's, it's really good. Really good news. There's also time for the lads to relax, <laughs> but not for long. It's a matter of hours before they are being briefed for the next task, taking over from a company in the ancient town of Nauzad, some 70 kilometers north of Camp Bastion. The mission is to drive the Taliban away from the town and make it safe for the local people to return. When we took over, the Royal Marines would not cross this line, would go no further north than about there which meant the Taliban had conducted the fix. They had the Royal Marines where they wanted them and they knew where they would go. Once we started to push north into their safe areas, they then felt they had to engage us. So we're starting to be able to hit them more on our terms in what is their safe areas. They have a sentry screen up here. We don't know exactly where they are, but there is a sentry screen here because whenever we push east of that wadi, they identify us. Well, we just had the briefing from a company. The things that have struck me are is how exposed the place is. Um, it, it's out of the range of our heavy artillery, so you, we really have to rely very much on our own fire support group that is on a hill above the main complex that we will be in. Um, other worrying things, uh, the Taliban here uh, fight and they stay. Unlike the guys you met in Jusile who decided to fight, and exfil, these guys stay and they fight. Also, apparently, they're very accurate with their mortar fire and with their small arms fire. And we'll just have to see what happens when we get there. The 140 men of B Company are preparing for their imminent departure. Tomorrow, an advance party will fly up to Nauzad District Centre, where they'll be based for the next six weeks. We don't know how we're getting up there. There are two routes. One is by road, obviously, that's incredibly dangerous. And the second option is by helicopter. Uh, however, the landing zone in Nauzad has been attacked regularly, so they're both pretty dangerous. Uh, we don't know exactly when we're going. We're just going to go off now and pack our kit, and uh, we're going to stand by, uh, ready to go. The kit and the lads are battle-weary, but after a brief spell in Bastion, morale is high. We've got to sort all our equipment out, our ammunition. Our weapon systems are key. Uh, we've fired a lot of ammunition through them over the last few weeks. Uh, so we need to uh, get them 100% clean, get them inspected. Uh, any faults that we've got, we need to get them uh, completed before we, before we redeploy. We're going to be uh, in, a, in a, a secure company uh, location. Uh, and our task there uh, is to again fight the Taliban, but what we can't do is just sit back and you know, wave at them. You know, we've got to take the fight to the enemy. You know, we're, we're not there to you know, mince around. We haven't trained uh, and done all the hard work we've done so far to mince around. I've just been told that we'll be travelling to Nauzad by Viking vehicle, crewed and driven by the Royal Marines. It was during such a journey through the Sangin Valley the 31-year-old Corporal Darren Bonner of A Company lost his life. When his body was flown back to the UK, his comrades in A Company were in the field. Captain Alex Strachan holds a memorial service for them to honour his memory. To you, O oh Lord, we commend the soul of Darren, your servant. In the sight of this world, he is now dead. In your sight, may he live forever. Forgive whatever sins he committed through human weakness, and in your goodness grant him everlasting peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gentlemen, if you'd like to be seated now, I'll run for you the montage that Sergeant Rumsey made up for us. Summer has come and passed. The innocent can never last Wake me up when September ends Here comes the rain again Falling from the 
stars drenched in my pain again becoming who we are as my memory rests but never forgets why The next morning, the advance party from B Company departs by Chinook for Nalzad. Tomorrow, we will travel through the desert to join them. It's just gone 2am in the morning, the guys have been loading the Vikings for the last half an hour, most of it was, was done last night. It's amazing that everything um, is done in virtually pitch darkness. Uh, these guys know these vehicles so well and their kit that they're able to do it basically blindfolded. Um, we're off in approximately 25 to 30 minutes, um, we have no idea how long it's going to take. Uh, Rough approximation, anything from 6 to 12 hours. We're travelling 70 kilometres north of Bastion to the ancient town of Nauzad. The terrain is hard and we're making slow progress. Our average speed is only 15 miles per hour. There's also the constant worry of hitting a landmine or running into an ambush. It's been just a little over five, oops, a little over five hours uh, since we left Bastion. Just had a message through on the comms that we're now in view of a &P Hill. Basically, that's our sanctuary. Uh, that's the hill that overlooks now Sad DC. And from there, they've got an arc of fire. We're now under that arc of fire. So <clears throat> we're hopefully safe from IEDs, mines. And should anyone be silly enough to attack us now, they'll get the good news <coughs> from the 50 cows and the mortars on AMP Hill. After six long, uncomfortable hours, we finally enter Nauzad District Centre and the relative security of the British base. As you can see behind me, the convoy made it safely in. Uh, we were flanking it for most of the way in here. I have to say, I'm mighty relieved to be here. Unfortunately, on the way here with the joggling about, I lost one of my teeth. Uh, old rugby injury had a fascia on it. The fascia's somewhere in the desert now. Officer in command Mick Aston is giving the soldiers an introduction to their new surroundings. I'll be straight with you, the tempo here uh, is a lot lower than what we've had up until now, all right? Um, that doesn't mean uh, we need to take it easy or become complacent. And to tell you the truth, that is my biggest fear. When you look out there and you go up to AMP Hill and you look out into the green zone over there, that's where the Taliban are. And they're there in force in well-defended positions, all right? And you only have to look out 400 metres from the front gate and that's where A Company got themselves into uh, a fair bit of trouble down there in Sakani. There is a lot of Taliban activity over there. There's a big wadi over there, and that's like a Taliban highway between the north 
and further down to the southeast to Musakala and Sangha. So there's a lot of them over there, uh, and we need to pick our fights. That's the direction that the CO gave me. Pick your fight. And when we do, we'll go out in strength. Pick the time and the place. And we choose that, not them. And we fucking put them in the hurt locker. <laughs> okay, fellas, that's all. That's the... The town of Nalzad is virtually deserted. Many locals left to escape the fighting, fleeing to outlying villages or finding sanctuary in the mountains. Trying to get a sense of our new base, I joined Private Thomas Cox in one of the four sentry posts known as Sangers. So how long have you been on stake now? Um, well, I came on at six this morning. So not very long ago, yeah. No, if, uh, so over the night we've been doing two hours in here and then having two hours rest. And, uh, Did you get to sleep in those two hours? Uh, we try to, yeah. Interesting that the uh, that green zone is where the Taliban are. They're dug yeah. in and they are what? Is that 200 metres? Um, two to 300? Yeah, yeah, two, 300 metres, yeah, pretty much. Uh, so they're in there right now. Yeah. Um, they sort of come when they want to come, or if they don't want to come, don't they? So unfortunately, they're back in court, which is uh, not the best way to have things. Well, uh, no, but uh, so you're going to be sort of playing hand you dealt with at the moment. I've been in a static location. Obviously, they've got the freedom of movement all around the town. As you can see up to the front, there's so many compounds out there mm. that they've got... They would have had, like, sort of... Um, rat runs. Rat runs, so literally they can get up within to uh, the compounds down there, about 20 to 30 metres. Well, the Gurkhas and the Paras were here, they were throwing grenades from just down there over into the compound. They can get that close, can't they? Yeah. That's the unfortunate thing about this compound. It is in the town. In fact, it's slap bang in the town. But there's no-one there now. The town's pretty much deserted at the moment, but we will get uh, civilians coming back in. Uh, they normally actually come up and ask permission, like, from the Sanger. Um, if they can go to their houses and, like, re-farm their fields. And, uh, so I'm hoping to just, like, try and get as many civilians back into the town as possible. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Part of B Company's role here is to encourage the local people to return to the town. With the present standoff between the Taliban and the British forces here, the prospect of it happening soon seems highly unlikely. And I just wonder how those people feel about the situation that exists here, because um, while we're stuck here and the Taliban are stuck there, um, no one in Nawazad is going to live um, a normal life. Pretty early here. The sun's already very high. Uh, that water is already very hot. Um, this is how we uh, do our ablutions in the desert. Um, I slept in there last night for the first time. My eyes uh, pretty gummy with um, with dust. It's just dropping all the time. Obviously got a lot of dust in the mouth. Um, gonna wash myself now, clean my teeth, and then. Uh, Try and sort out some breakfast, put the stove on, make a cup of tea. So, there are two types of water here. It's drawn up from the well. Um, stuff that you wash with is not treated, and the stuff that you drink, obviously, that comes with a white seal on it. Um, that's had uh, chlorine tablets or iodine tablets put into it. So. So 
so wherever I go now, whichever hotel I ever end up in, I'm never going to complain about the bathroom. We've been here just 24 hours, and B Company are already preparing for their first patrol in Nauzad. They'll be going up to a &P Hill for some orientation with the fire support group, and I'll be spending the night there. When A Company were here, they were often engaged by the Taliban just outside the base, so we leave with a certain amount of trepidation. It may be early in the morning, but the temperature is already soaring. We've just come out of the main gates of, um, of Nalzad DC. We're moving in now to uh, what was Nalzad Town. Um, the road over there is called RPG Alley, for obvious reasons. And we're just making our way um, onto the eastern part of Nalzad Town. A&P Hill now. Uh, this is home to B Company's fire support group, and they um, they basically keep watch over over uh, now ZDC. Um, they have pretty awesome firepower capabilities, 50 cals, uh, grenade machine guns, and mortars. Um, we're so far away from Bastion now that the uh, the artillery can't help us. We can call in um, fast air. That takes a bit of time. And also the attack helicopters. We've got some warning shots just gone off over there. Let's keep moving, I think. Yeah, I'm just trying to see who it is that I'm aiming at. Well, it frightened me, and it certainly frightened the sheep. More shots going off now. We'll keep on the move. More shots going off now. They're just for uh, test this firing a 50 cal because oh, right. they're quiet for a while. So, uh, stand down, everybody. They're just testing a 50 cal. The fortification was built as a firing point by the Russians during their occupation of Afghanistan some 20 years ago. Today, it is named after the Afghan National Police. It gives extraordinary views over both Nauzad and the surrounding area. Colour Sergeant Ivan Snow wastes no time in orientating the new arrivals. Turn around, guys. Right, look to your front. This is known as the Western Ridges. Does anybody not orientate to the ground? If you look plus of nails out on the left-hand side, you'll see some opened areas. Look further right, further right, half right, wrong, half left. Half left! Keep you on your toes. This is known as Shanjilak. Look right. This area here is known as Krazi Afghan. In the area of Shanjilak, which Tal Taliban do go into. Also Al Zaire and Hal Jamal. We believe also that they do move up and down a resupply from Dahana. Has anyone not seen this? What's it called? Plymouth. Plymouth. Fuck no, we're going to change that. OK, that will be now known as Whiz Beach, and we'll get that down. <laughs> the fire support group will be living on ANP Hill for the next six weeks. The hill is a warren of gun positions and sleeping quarters carved out of the mud. It reminds me of something out of the First World War. Corporal Pink Toynton gives me the full tour. As you can tell, mate, you know, you've got guys living here and you've got weapon systems and ammunition and it's, it's really tight and um, obviously you've got to duck everywhere you go. And I don't know if you... How many times have you caught your head when you first go? Uh, all the time, all the time. Now I just keep as low as possible. But I don't know if you notice it, but the air is really muggy and then you find yeah. it hard to breathe. Yeah, it's, uh, it's full of dust, isn't it? Uh, you've got Faz and Lammy who live down here oh, and obviously right. they've got to stand two position as well, mate, which is very similar arcs to TT. Right, with the GPM doing it. Yeah. Yeah, but obviously it's covered up. 
and then if you come in here, mate, you've got bed spaces on the right. It's a, it's a bit like a medieval fort, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. It's like Gibraltar or something like that. <laughs> Follow me this way, Ross. Yeah. My introduction to the hill is interrupted when the men on guard spot something suspicious. Yeah, DC call sign's nearly in. Right, guys, what we've had uh, reports of from the ICOM is 12 Taliban are leaving Shangelak and moving to the area of Taliban HQ. Get amongst your positions now. Make sure you guys are uh, keeping the rise on Taliban HQ to the left and slightly to the right. Yeah. Are there any questions on that? No. no. OK. Did you see it right on the far left-hand corner? See where that building you're looking at? With the white band? Yeah. Yeah. You'll see a dark shadow. That's caused by that tree in front of it. You can even see that with the naked eye. Yeah, yeah I can see it. Too. You see that? Yeah. Teddy, concentrate yeah. on this area over there. Yeah, I've got with, Scotty. With that sight. We, we can look at Taliban HQ with what we've got here. Haven't seen any other movement? No. Nah. The only thing we've had is that icon chatter. Yeah. We've seen one motorcyclist. Oh, pinged motorcyclist. Where is he? He's moving along that compound. He's just gone into the green zone, heading towards Taliban HQ. Yeah, what dish dash on the black turban? Concentrating that area there, yeah, like well, you said, not Taliban long. HQ with this yeah, area. Yeah. The guys are now trying to positively ID these, uh, these 12 Taliban. Um, because the green zone is so thick, it's very difficult for them from this distance, even with all the magnification and the lenses they have, to actually see what's going on through those trees. And that presents a really big problem for them because they, they don't want to engage a farmer on his way home for his, uh, his supper. O.C. McAston orders a test fire of the guns. This serves two purposes. It's a show of force to the Taliban across the wadi and it lets them know that B Company are now operational. Mick is optimistic that there could be a contact with the enemy. Mm. Might even bring him out, we'll see. All right, I'd get Kenno out of there for me, mate. So stick in a, yes, sticking sir. a stick into the hornet's nest to yeah, see what comes yeah, out. We'll see, we'll see what happens. SF Gunners! Rapid! Fire! The FSG, the fire support group, fire! testing their weapons. They're just about to put some more mortars over. There you go, the mortars. Uh, they're aiming at a, a tree line that's um, not that far, it's not actually into the green zone, but it has stimulated the Taliban. There's lots of toing and throwing now. But also, the main purpose really is to make sure that all their weapon systems are in place, that they work, and also they're zeroed in. Right, guys, that's all weapons systems uh, test fired, and that's our uh, shell force uh, complete. Uh, that gun's firing slow. Sorted. Mick, that's now sorted. Sorted. Got and the 50 cal. Sorted. It's now sorted. Excellent. Right, the patrol. I haven't seen them leave. They should have left by now. Yeah. Be working in and around that area there, just left of the uh, petrol pump. Let's get around the guys. Don't take the helmets off. Stay near their weapon systems. Uh, should the platoon need them? Any questions? Come back on that. No. Okay. Things have quietened down, and I continue my tour of the hill. We've got the shower area, yep. which is uh, shower bags hanging up, and obviously you've got to use as, as minimal water as possible. Uh, we, we're trying to get the guys to have one shower every two days, but because now we've run out of water, we can't shower. Right. So obviously if you have a quick look in there, there's no water. They're the toilets that we're currently using, obviously. Nothing glamorous, and you've got a little bit of top tube water. goes down into a hole, and you piss. Yeah, it. basically, and then obviously these are the shitters. What happens is um, it is a throne. You, yeah, if you leave the seat up, it attracts flies, and flies obviously maggots, infection, and also we've got a hand cleaning gel, so it's, it's nothing glamorous, but it disinfects your hands. No, no, exactly. You want to keep yourself from getting yeah. uh, diarrhoea and vomiting. Don't yeah, you? definitely. Yeah, and if we get that up here, everyone seen, will get it. Some of the toilets in the world haven't got views like that, have they? No, they haven't. No, and but. Some of the toilets in the world also haven't got as much danger out there. That's mm -hmm. true. Right, ready. It's just after 5am and the guys are taking advantage of the relative cool of the morning to do some exercise. But it's not just a vanity workout. If they don't keep up their fitness levels, they will struggle when they go out on patrol. Carrying a kit that weighs 36 kilograms in temperatures of up to 50 degrees centigrade. Good morning. It's just gone five on A and P Hill. Um, it's a stunning morning. 
Uh, and last night, the canopy of stars that were over me as I looked up from my bunk were just incredible. Um, there's a beautiful breeze blowing. Uh, the mountains uh, are lit against the sky. They look amazing. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful view um, from where I am right now, as it was last night. Uh, and the tragic thing is that um, here we are sat with a load of guys trying to kill a load of guys that are just over there. I'm heading back down the hill for a meeting, or Shura, between B Company and some of the elders from Nauzad. These meetings serve many purposes, to gather intelligence and to form friendships with the locals, whose main concern is to harvest their crops without getting shot at by either side. <laughs> this is Mick Aston's first shura in Nauzad. The smiles and cordiality mask the tension that exists here. Gentlemen, first let me say how pleased I am uh, that everybody could make it here today to come and have a, have a talk to us about uh, the situation in Nauzad. I understand uh, you, you're busy with your, with your tribes and the work and the harvest that's going on at the moment, and I very much appreciate you taking the time out to come and speak to me today. Mick wants to know what he and his men are up against. How many Taliban do they think are, are in the area? About thousand men. A thousand here in Nauzad? Yes. This people say. All, all the time, or do they come and go? Oh, when they met with the Taliban this morning, was it was it near here? Was it near to the DC? Could they tell us where that happened? the next time the Taliban come and ask him for food, for food, yeah. tell them I will give them all the food they want over here. <laughs> the Taliban can come and eat here. Yeah. They've quoted a thousand. The general rule of thumb that we've come across is divide everything by ten. Um, so there might be there might be more. A hundred probably sounds more realistic. What would you say that you've gained and, and they may have gained from, from your first shura with them? We've got a couple of little snippets that we might be able to develop on the intelligence side. And if we can get um, some resolution on who the local commander is, we can start building that uh, intelligence picture on him. Other than that, we didn't really get a lot that we can act on. The shura confirms my suspicion that the locals are stuck in the middle, providing unreliable information for fear of reprisal. The only thing that is certain is that at 2 a.m. tomorrow, I will be going out on patrol. The men are settling into their new home in Nauzad and the regular patrols where they can expect contact with the enemy at any point. As per the brief before, or the imp brief, with the trenches and everything, they can outflank us and come up to our position without us even knowing. So every time we go for them, make sure we got all around the fence. Um, before we lead off, check your men as per normal, all right? because the last thing we want is to leave anybody behind. We're just about to go on a patrol into Nauzed town centre with five platoon. 
uh, foreseeable problems uh, are these. Last night, um, the guys on AMP Hill mortared Taliban positions, and we don't know whether they've laid some booby traps in the town centre. They're pretty difficult to see at the best of times in daylight, nearly damn impossible to see at night time. found a uh, heat source approximately 400 metres long wood, bro blue, uh, wood block one. Mm. Is that a dickhead, do you think? Um, it could be anything. Right. <laughs> could be a dog, could it? Could be, yeah, it could be a dog. Where's the eastern gate you're going yet? Yeah? I want zero upper. I want to Charlie up. I want to Charlie. Were you going back as a call sign complete other? See the place is completely decimated. Um, there's no one living here. But what there is all over the place are little rat runs that the Taliban use to get up close, very up close, to where uh, where the soldiers are staying in the DC. Everywhere you look, you can see these Taliban tunnels that lead up into compounds that can give them firing positions very, very close to Nauzad DC, which is basically the headquarters of the British soldiers here. We've been out on patrol for five hours. The sun is now up, and it's already in the 40s. There's been no contact with the enemy, but the fear of IEDs and booby traps is ever present. But as we turn for home, movement is spotted. Push back into the compounds. We've gone focus to find a van unloading gear. A split, the platoon split into two arcs. The one that's gone to the right flank has discovered a vehicle unloading equipment, and so we've been asked to withdraw back to cover so they can investigate the vehicle. The guys wanted to check this vehicle out. It's, it's people packing up to leave. The town is virtually deserted. Obviously, the last uh, stragglers are packing up the last of their belongings, locking up and getting the hell out of Dodge. We get back to base and it's time for a well-earned cup of tea. In a couple of days, I'll be making one in my own kitchen as I'm returning to the UK. I've been with the men of B Company for over a month, and it's opened my eyes to the truth of modern warfare. We are led to believe that a modern war is fought electronically from a distance. But this modern war is fought every day at close quarters with bayonets fixed. I can honestly say, I don't, I don't think anyone of us here actually expects to be doing this. No? Yeah. You ask the majority of boats, and this is what they say, the joint. No, when, when you sign that bit of paper and whatever, and you, you read the news at that time that we've all done it, there's nothing like this was going on for the majority of us, and you'd never think you'd actually be involved with trying to shoot people and people shooting at you. Who are you fighting for? Are you fighting for, for the government, queen and country? Well, Fighting for each other, mate. Them blokes are, at the end of the day, the queen and country aren't holding a rifle either side of you, holding a weapon. They're, you can't trust them, you're not relying on them at all. You're relying on every bloke that's around you that's got a weapon system keeping you alive as you're doing for them. So, guys, do you think the people back home appreciate what you're doing here? 
I don't think they, they right. fully understand. They, they don't have the, the life experience or the experiences of being under contact or doing the patrols out here with all the kit, with the heat, with the, the living conditions. They just don't, they don't know. You're out here, you're risking your lives. Um, do you think you get paid enough for what you do? No. <laughs> I, get, I, get some, I get some peanuts now I'll and then. I'll show you how much he gets a month. New uh, guy? Shay? Take home about £1,000 a month. It's not much, really, for what we do, but we've got our own money, isn't it? Yeah, it's just time served as well. I mean, like with any job, the longer you've done the job, the, the higher your increment goes. Or the the more you, yeah, well, something like that. You get, you get more money. Mm. You know? So the, the newer guys, they complain they get, don't get as much money as the more senior guys, but then they haven't done the time served. Um, how many of you are thinking about getting out after this tour, then? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Really, guys? Yeah. I mean, you're experienced guys, aren't you? You're guys that, you know, you've been career soldiers. You're trained to be an infantry soldier to do one job, which is to fight, essentially. Once you've done a tour like this, you can't go back to someone like Brecken and throw surely grenades and fire blanks at someone. It's, it's just not the same, Cause, you know? Because you get shouted at, saying, in real life, you'd be killed, and you actually stand like that. Actually, we've done that in Afghanistan, and you're yeah. wrong, and we're right, so fuck off. Yeah. Everything that a soldier trains for, we have almost used every every part of that on this tour so far, and and if they want to, you know, you know, get out of the army and pursue a life somewhere else, then you know, hats off to them. That, you know, and I'm more than happy for them to do that. Leaving the army is always a hot topic of debate. Battle weariness and missing home takes its toll. But five months on, as we edit this film. Only four soldiers from B Company have asked to leave. Tomorrow, I take a helicopter to Camp Bastion on the first leg of my journey home. Before I leave, I attend a memorial service for the fallen. The men I'm leaving behind still have three months to serve. In the 12 weeks they've been here, they've lost three men to enemy fire. The first to die was 19-year-old Private Chris Gray, who lost his life only a few hundred meters from where I'm sitting. The following shows what happened moments after he was shot by Taliban forces. His family and the army have given us permission to broadcast this footage. Man down. Who is it? On me. I don't know yet. Let's go. Through there, Simo. Get him to me now. Get locked. Get a casualty to me. Get a casualty to me now. Get him off, mate. Get him done. I want a section to put suppressive fire down. Let's go. Who is it? Where's he hit? Come on. Let's get him. Get his kill off him. Get it off of him. Get it off of him. He's gone. No, he's alive. Right, get him back. Get him back. Get him back. Leave his kit. Get him back. Right, get him back. Just go. Just go. It needs to be quick. Come on. Keep going. Keep going. Best speed. Where's the fucking medic? I'm here. I want him. He's still there, I want him. Kev, keep me updated. Where's his fucking, where's his fucking body armor? Get me that fucking body armor out now. Where the fuck did it go through? Went through the side. There. There, there we go. Fucking hell. Through there and up there. Oh, I can't believe that. don't want to believe it's true. You, you want to believe that they're coming home? You want to think that they're coming home? You do. I just want him to come home so much. I just want him to walk through my door, dump his bag and raid the fridge, plonk himself down. I don't sleep very well. I can't get to sleep at night and I wake up constantly through the night. You cat napping, you're not off it, you wake up and it is right in your face. And some days it is there all day. It's like this brick, massive brick wall has been built 
and I can't get over that brick wall. And I feel like some days I'm never going to get over that brick wall, I'm never going to get through it. Mm. He always said, he says to me, I'm going to be the best mum. I'm going to be the best soldier you watch. He said it in training. He said, I'm going to bring you home a medal. He said, I don't want a medal, I just want you, Chris. To make sure you come home. But it's not. I've been to Afghanistan and seen the human cost of this war, but nothing prepares you for meeting someone like Helen and the sacrifices being made by the soldiers and by their families. Her son, Chris Gray, won't be coming home, and she and her family will have to live with that for the rest of their lives. It's not long before I return to Afghanistan. I'm rejoining the men in Kajaki to follow them on some of their most dangerous operations to date. If you'd like more information on the series, go to the website skyone.co.uk slash rosskemp. Next on Sky One, Escape 2.0 is on in brand new Prison Break.